and welcome back to part two of our Cardiac Academy series, the introduction to electrocardiography. Stay tuned, we've got a lot of stuff coming up ahead. So welcome back. We're going to talk about the EKG and the history. But before we do that, let's start off with a uh, little bit of review from what we've talked about. So in review, we had discussed about the cardiac electropathways here. Uh, so essentially, we have the SA node, we've got our internodal pathways, we've got our um, AV node and AV junction, bundle of Hiss, and our Purkinje fibers here with our bundle branches. And we talked about um, all the different structures. We talked about uh, the labeling and the names that they had. And uh, really, it's not important to remember the names of the internodal pathways. You can just call them the internodal pathways. That'll, that'll suffice for most uh, general usage. Uh, as long as you remember how the electro, uh, electrical energy is conducted through the heart and how it's conducted through the cells. So um, in addition to this, uh, we talked about the properties of the myocardial uh, myocytes. Uh, they have the elasticity, the conductivity, contractility, automaticity, and rhythmicity. And these are properties that are often unique to cardiac uh, muscle tissue that's not often present in all other tissues, uh, especially some of the automaticity and rhythmicity uh, components to it. And uh, we also talked about the uh, myocardial membrane action potential. Uh, and now this is how the heart um, distributes its energy and how each cell fires and depolarizes. Now, we'll cover this a little bit more later when we talk about how different cardiac drugs affect this and affect the heart. But we just wanted to cover the general overview of the cardiac anatomy, and that's what we did back in episode one. So, now we're uh, also talking about the combined electrical potential. Uh, this is where we put all the myocytes together, and this is how you get the EKG. Now, this is from um, Brunwald's uh, cardiology, and this is what's often taught, but there are some limitations to this particular teaching. Uh, those limitations are that this doesn't really accurately represent how you get the EKG. Uh, it shows everything lining up nice and perfectly with you know all the spikes for the ventricular uh, depolarization lining up and showing the positive deflection. Well, what about when you have something like this? doesn't really seem to fit that model. Uh, that's because the EKG has less to do with the uh, lining up of the tissues, uh, and all nice positive deflection, and more to do with um, something different, but it has more to do with energy vectors. And we're going to talk about it in the electrocardiogram. So let's talk about how the electrocardiogram was conceived, derived. Now, uh, we're going to talk about the introduction, sort of. So when most people talk about the EKG, they're thinking about Einthoven, but we're going to talk about a different device. This is the Lippmann Capillary Electrometer, Electro, yes, Electrometer. And essentially this has a mercury meniscus, a mercury level that's in some sulfuric acid that uh, can essentially uh, show some capacitance uh, through the thoracic uh, tissue just to show the electrical potential. Now, this is a very sensitive piece of equipment, especially for back in the day when they really didn't have, you know, oscilloscopes and all this fancy electricity that they could work with. Uh, so this was uh, quite some time ago, and they were able to get tracings that looked like this. Uh, now, this is uh, a tracing uh, that was created by uh, Dr. Waller. And what he did is he essentially had this, uh, this narrow-focused light projecting on some photo paper, and he would pull the photo paper through during the heartbeat. And that shadow would uh, show the different, uh, you know, levels of the mercury uh, inside that uh, capillary uh, electrometer. And so this is how they first derived the EKG. So enter Willem Einthoven. Uh, now Einthoven is a Dutch um, uh, physiologist who uh, created the EKG. I've been calling him German this entire time, which is, uh, you know, apparently quite offensive. He's not German. He's, he's Dutch. He studied, um, I believe, in the UK, um, and he founded, uh, he was one of the head instructors at a Dutch academy. So he developed the EKG using some technology. In fact, he, uh, he's 
you know, widely credited as being the inventor of um, electrocardiography. He's, uh, you know, even gotten a Nobel Prize in medicine for his developments. So this is his string galvanometer. Uh, essentially, it uses a fine quartz string, if you will, uh, that's coated in silver to, uh, to respond to the electrical impulses. Now, this early uh, galvan galvan <clears throat> his early EKG machine was actually quite large and quite unwieldy, um, by modern standards, that is. Uh, his galvanometer was uh, about um, 600 pounds, if I recall, filled up two rooms and took five people to operate. It required a, uh, a special water jacket around the magnets used, the big electromagnets, uh, to prevent them from overheating. Um, so it was kind of crude, and if you told him, hey, someday, you know, paramedics are going to have this. In fact, you could probably even get an EKG right, uh, you know, from a $100 device uh, that you can buy over the counter. I'm not sure if it's over the counter. Maybe it is, but there's a little EKG device that you can buy. Uh, it's an add-on for an iPhone. Uh, so if you told him that, he'd probably scoff and laugh and say, there's no way. There's no way that a paramedic can take this 500, 600 pound device that takes up two rooms out into the field. Uh, except there weren't paramedics back then, there were just uh, ambulance attendants. You know, no way this would happen. Uh, but sure enough, it did. So this is the early acquisition of an EKG. And because the skin has uh, the um, stratum corneum, which is the essentially the crust on the top of the skin, it prevents good electrical conduction through the skin. We're actually not a great conductor of electricity. Uh, so a lot of the electrical energy from the heart gets lost getting out towards the skin. So Eindhoven overcame this by putting uh, the patient's hands and feet into buckets of like this salt brine. It's like a saline brine type solution to break down that impedance. Uh, so as you can imagine doing it this day. Uh, but the buckets um, are positioned at the both hands and in the left foot there, which is consistent with what we do now where we think about our Eindhoven triangle, the way that we put the leads. Most lead systems now use at least four, but the minimum you could use is three. You could use, uh, you know, the three traditional placements uh, of Eindhoven's Triangle. So, let's talk about Eindhoven's Triangle a little bit. Each one of the leads has a different purpose, and it can vary based on which lead you're looking at. Um, or sorry, each one of the, uh, the electrodes has a different purpose. It could be either positive or negative, or it could be a ground, depending on which view you're using. So uh, this caused the deflections that uh, we know as different waves. So let's talk a little bit about the waves. This is the, uh, uh, the original waveform that was created by the uh, uh, capillary device there. And Dr. Weller and Dr. Einthoven had different approaches to the way that they named it. So the first thing that they noticed, there was two humps. And they figured out quickly that this was corresponding to ventricular depolarization and repolarization. So Dr. Weller named it V1 and V2. Uh, fairly logical. Uh, Dr. Einthoven uh, took a different approach and named it A and B. You know, first and second letters of the alphabet, also a, a logical approach. So once the equipment got refined a little bit further, they found that, you know, there was this other thing over here. There was an atrial depolarization. So Dr. Weller called it, you know, an A wave. You know, makes sense, atrial ventricular. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Einthoven, well, he already used the letter A, so, uh, I, I, all right, you know what? I guess we have to start over. We're going to create an improved Einthoven 2.0. So he, he re-lettered it and created this as A. Makes sense. It's the first one. The first downward deflection that they saw, they made a B, then a C, and just so happened they didn't see the, uh, the downward deflection at the end, so they labeled the repolarization D. Uh, you know, as they did some more EKGs, they found that not only did they have the negative deflection at the end uh, that they didn't label, but also there were some inaccuracies with the string galvometer that they needed to rectify with, with, some, uh, with some fancy math. Uh, essentially, they had to run it through a mathematical formula to do some transformations to make it appear correctly. Now, when you do math and you transform one waveform into another waveform, you, you can't use the same letters. That's going to cause confusion. So what they ended up doing is they had to pick different sets of letters. So we're going to have to enter into a new uh, a new model here. But let's do uh, let's do this instead. Einthoven 
So the first letter that Descartes uses when he labels his uh, points on a curve and when he uses um, when you do proofs uh, in terms of uh, geometry, the first point they use is usually point P. So we're going to start with labeling the first uh, wave as P. Then we're going to call it Q, R, S, and then T. So lots of people give uh, give credit to uh, to Dr. Einthoven for being forward thinking and saying, hey, there might be other letters, but really he just used Descartes' model and said that this is the first letter, we're going to start with P. It's great because if there's another letter that ever came up before it, he'd be ready for it, since you know he'd already been burned with that once. So let's talk a little bit about rules. So the rules for the P wave, there's some certain characteristic shapes for, for a normal P wave. Uh, for a normal P wave, it's located out in front of uh, the large spike we will call the QRS complex, and it's always initiated by the sinus node. And that is you know, one of the hard rules. If it is not initiated by a sinus node, let's say you've got a premature atrial contraction or a premature atrial complex, if you have a PAC that is created by not the sinus node, by convention, we don't call that a P wave. Uh, we actually call that a P prime wave. Now, it can be up to 2.5 millimeters tall, a little bit under, Anything over that, you've got some sort of atrial enlargement, which is an abnormal finding. And it's normally about 120 milliseconds or less. Uh, usually you'll find it to be, on average, about 2 millimeters by 2 millimeters if you look at the graph paper on the EKG. And the normal axis, we'll talk about axis a little bit later, but the normal axis is between 0 and uh, 75. I know there's, there's minus signs, there's actually dashes. That's kind of confusing the way I put it that way. So it's between 0 and 75. Uh, so it goes in the same direction as most everything else. And it should always appear as upright in lead 2 in a normal EKG. And also when you look at AVR, it should appear upper, uh, inverted in AVR. And if you see it being upright in AVR, that's a good indicator that maybe you might have some lead reversal going on. So if your partner does an EKG or you do an EKG and you see an upright AVR, double check and make sure that all the limb leads are in the right places. So, as I mentioned, non-sinus P waves are called P prime waves. So, the next one is the Q wave. Uh, Q waves have different, uh, different designations, uh, but it's always located out in front, in front of the QRS, between the P wave and the R wave. And not everybody has a Q wave. As the first negative deflection before the R wave, once you hit the R wave, the next negative deflection cannot be a Q wave by convention. It has to come before it, otherwise there's, there's simply no Q wave present, which is not abnormal or pathologic. We call it a Q wave with a lowercase if it's just a small little, I guess you'd call it a nub, small, less than one third of the amplitude or less than 40 milliseconds in width or one millimeter. That's, that's normal. That's a physiologic Q wave, or some people call it a septal Q wave. And that usually represents like a septal depolarization, which we'll talk about later. If you call it a Q wave with a capital Q, that means that it's more than one third of the amplitude, or wider than 40 milliseconds, and that is a pathologic finding. There's usually a sign of an old infraction there. So now there's R waves. Uh, R waves are fairly self-explanatory. It's the tall upright complex. Any positive deflection in the QRS above the uh, isoelectric line, that baseline, is considered an R wave. So you can call it a little R wave if it's less than one third. The same general rules apply. And now these are less, uh, less significant and less strict in their interpretation as far as uppercase or lowercase than it is with the Q wave. Uh, because really even a small R wave doesn't typically represent pathology unless it's you know some certain findings in the leads. We'll cover that at a different point. But each subsequent deflection, if you have two, two spikes, we'll call the second one an R prime. And now we'll go into the S waves. So S waves come after the R wave, and it's any negative deflection after the R wave. Um, and the findings are pretty much the same, capital, lowercase. These conventions, again, are not quite as as strictly adhered to as the Q wave. And again, any negative deflection afterwards, after the initial S wave, is labeled S prime. So the T wave is generally referred to as the, the hump after the QRX, and it represents ventricular repolarization. 
Um, I guess calling it a hump is not really a rule, it's just a general explanation. So it is normally positive and may be inverted in V1 and lead 3, and sometimes in AVR, but it's normally in a positive orientation. So let's do some quick labeling practice here. So with the first one, we've got a lowercase r, it's a small r wave, we've got a deep s, then we've got an r prime. The next one, well, we've just got the one upright complex, so that's just an R wave. Now the third one, let's see, we've got a small normal physiologic Q. We've got an R wave and an S wave. So that would be a full QRS complex. This one, we've got an R wave, but next to it, we've got, you know, another little R wave, or what we'd call an R prime. And then this last one, well, it's, it's an all negative deflection. There's no positive deflection leading into it. It's just all negative. So what do we call that? Do we call that a Q? Or do we maybe call that an S? I don't know. Well, why don't we split the difference? And what we've done in electrocardiography is we just call that a QS complex. So is it a Q? Is it an S? It's a QS. Uh, <clears throat> sort of taking the, the best of both worlds or you know, meeting a compromise between differing opinions as to whether it represents a Q or an S. You can argue it both ways, and I won't bother you with the semantics. So what are some causes for things to be positive or negative? Well, it all comes down to energy vectors. So an energy vector is very much like a Doppler shift. When energy uh, moves towards an electrode, you get a positive deflection. Just like you heard that car horn getting higher, the energy rises as well. So you see a more positive deflection from the positive electrode. Energy going away from the positive electrode has a negative deflection. So think of that uh, car horn whenever you think about the direction that the energy is moving. So we have to look at the positive electrode and try and think of it as a camera. It's the camera in that view, and you saw it both rising and falling. So let's take a look at how that camera analogy applies to the EKG. <clears throat> so here again is Einthoven's triangle. And in the typical lead one, you'll find the camera located on the right arm view. And it's pointed towards the left. So the camera is always at the positive electrode looking at the negative electrode. So here it looks from right arm to left arm. Sorry, left arm to right arm. <clears throat> and that's why when you look at the EKG below, energy moving towards that camera in lead one, you see a positive deflection on the EKG paper. So that's why you see it rising. Now lead two shows us from a different view. Lead two goes from the right arm to the foot, the left foot specifically. And in this particular EKG, and I chose this one specifically to illustrate this, you see both a positive deflection uh, and a negative deflection. That means the energy, just like that video on the, um, on the car Doppler effect, must be going perpendicular to where we're looking because it's both rising and falling. And now lead three, if we look at this particular lead three, all the energy is predominantly negative. It's got a tiny little nub of an R wave, and then it's got a deep S. So most of the energy is moving away from the camera, so that's why it's drawing a negative deflection. So when we look at the overall energy, it's moving sort of in this upward direction. And we can actually map that out as a direction on like a compass. And with a EKG, we actually start labeling from the right, and we go downward, which is different from what you typically do in mathematics. Normally you do it from the right, and you go counterclockwise. Uh, this actually continues clockwise. And there's a good reason for that, because when you look at the heart, uh, the heart is actually um, oriented a little bit differently than you may expect. The base of the heart, where it anchors to most of the tissue, is up at the top. That's the base, and we refer to the tip as the apex. So that's why when we look at the EKG, uh, when you look at the EKG vector, we look at it in relation to that. So that's why that energy is moving up. So now that was a little bit abnormal. 
Um, that's not what you typically see in most uh, patients. So when we look at the EKG, it, again, here's the different camera views. You've got the lead one over here, lead two down there, and lead three. Uh, now there's other cameras down here at the bottom, and those are labeled a little differently. Those are AVF, AVL, and AVR. So what does the A stand for? The A stands for augmented. So those are augmented voltage leads. Uh, and what that, what that actually means is you actually have two negative electrodes or negative poles that it's comparing it to. So if you have the camera located at the feet, you've got negative located both at the right arm and the left arm. And that means that it essentially splits the difference and looks directly vertically from the patient's perspective from the feet. From the AVL, the L stands for left arm. You've got the camera located on your left arm and it is facing down between those two negative electrodes. So it's kind of pointing diagonal there. Same thing with AVR. It's from the right arm going in between the two negative electrodes. And so if we were to look at the Einthoven triangle as the triangle that it is, this actually represents different directions of energy. Now this is sliced every uh, 60 degrees. But when we add in the, uh, the augmented voltage leads, which look at things a little bit differently, uh, the augmented voltage leads actually split now every 30 degrees. So now this is what we would call our hexaxial EKG. And the term hexaxial just means that there's six different leads that ma make up the axis. You've got your one, two, and three, and your, diff your three augmented voltage leads. It's a, it's a fancy way of saying it's a six lead EKG. So again, this is uh, split up in every 30 degrees. And this is actually quite helpful in terms of figuring out which direction energy is going. Let's take a look at this example over here. Now in this example, um, <clears throat> you know, we've got a nice tall R wave in lead one. So lead one, if you remember, it looks from the left of the patient to the right. So if the energy is going towards lead one, that means it's moving in this direction. Now let's take a look at another lead. Let's take a look at lead three. I'm oh, sorry, lead two. So lead two, you've also got a positive reflection. That means the energy is also coming towards the camera that way. Now let's take a look at lead uh, three. Lead three is biphasic. It's a little bit hard to see with some of the, the artifact at the end there, but it's both an R and an S. Um, and overall, between those two, it's it's a small R with a small S, so it's barely positive going in this direction. So it's just a small little amount of energy going this way. So if it's small energy going that way, it seems to be going more or less perpendicular to that. And we do have a lead that is perpendicular to lead three, uh, and that would happen to be uh, AVR up here. So looking at AVR, the camera is again up on the right shoulder looking down and across. So looking at the EKG, AVR is an all negative deflection. That means that the energy is going largely away from AVR. So if you had to put it together, a look at the energy is going away from AVR down towards uh, the 30 degree mark there. So that's the direction that the energy seems to be following. So it's about 30 degrees, uh, probably just a little bit more than 30 degrees, <clears throat> because you still have a little bit of positive energy towards 3. So like 31, something along with 32. There's another method. You know, a method that I think might be a little bit easier to do, uh, or more precise to do. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. This is not more easier to do. This is more accurate to do. Uh, now, this is probably something you'll never do on scene, but it's great at actually uh, looking at the uh, direct energy and measuring it out. So looking at this, the height of the R wave, the sorry, the QRS complex in lead one is about 10 millimeters. So uh, that means uh, if we look at AVF, which is perpendicular to that, the height of that is about 6.5 millimeters. So we have, we're gonna do some math here, so bear with me here. So if we picture a triangle on this graph here with a, um, a base of uh, 10 millimeters and a height of about 6.5 millimeters, 
and with a right angle at the end, I think we can we can do some trigonometry to figure out the exact angle. So that's the angle they're trying to figure out, and that's what we don't know what it is. So looking at the math, you've got your uh, you've got your Sokotoa, and uh, that's your rep representation of which trigonometric function you're going to use. So in this case, we have the opposite and the adjacent to the angle we're trying to figure out, so we're going to use tangent. So the tangent of that angle is equal to the opposite over the adjacent. So let's, uh, let's break this down. The tangent of that angle will be 6.5 divided by 10, which actually happens to work out quite well for math purposes. So tangent of the angle is equal to 0 0.65. In order to figure out the actual angle, we have to inverse, invert that tangent function. And doing so on our calculator yields us an answer of that angle being 33 point uh, a bunch. So essentially, it's 33 degrees which seems to fit with our other method that where you looked at the direction that it's going and said it's probably about just a little bit more than 30 degrees. So <clears throat> this is another method you could use. Now, I wouldn't really recommend doing this on scene. This is wholly not practical to do, break out your calculator and, and do the math. But I just wanted you to understand this is, this is how the math is derived. This is where it all comes from. And if you really wanted to, if, and you want to, you know, get into some banal discussions about EKG access on some EKG forums, well, now you've got the ammunition for how to calculate that axis. So, you know, that's uh, that's another method. And if you're looking at it being like, there's got to be an easier way. This is way too complicated. There is, for practical purposes. So don't panic. You know, there there is a better way. So we're going to talk about EKG axis the practical way. So when we look at this, this, uh, we want to try and figure out which direction the energy is going. So let's take a look at again our leads 1 and AVF. So in lead 1, the camera is over on the left, the energy is positive, so it's moving towards the camera. Which half of the circle, towards which half of the circle is that energy moving? Well, it's moving that direction, towards the camera. And now if we look at AVF, the camera's down at the feet, looking perpendicular. That's also positive. That means the energy is moving down towards the camera. Which quadrant does that, those two energy vectors or energy directions overlap in? Well, it overlaps in the, uh, the bottom right quadrant there. Or, well, if you look at it from a patient's perspective, it'll be bottom left. And we want to really break it down in terms of quadrant. And really, that for practical EKG interpretation, that's all that matters. You just have to figure out the direct quadrant uh, to get a good idea of what's going on with your patient. So this is your normal axis. Normally people have an axis anywhere from 0 to 90. Technically you could have a normal axis that goes up to negative 30 and some people argue will say up to 100. To keep it simple we're gonna say 0 to 90. And the if we move down to the other side, yes it's on the left on the graph but you have to think about you know this from the patient's heart perspective. This would be a deviation of the heart axis to the patient's right. So this is a right axis deviation. Consequently, on the other side, we've got a left axis deviation. And what are we going to call that last one there? Well, we're calling it extreme axis deviation. It used to be called extreme right axis deviation. Then some people got into some, you know, discussion saying, well, it's not necessarily in the right direction. It could be a left. So, to avoid any sort of controversy or uh, discussion, we just uh, call it extreme axis. Uh, but you'll still hear some people refer to it as the extreme right axis deviation. Uh, so let's talk about left axis deviation. Now, left axis deviation has uh, a couple of factors associated with it, some pathologies that I want you to be aware of, and this is why we're talking about EKG axis. You know, we have things like left ventricular hypertrophy where the tissue on the left side of the heart is uh, a little bit thicker and a little bit stronger, so you're going to have a shift of the EKG axis in that direction. You can have conduction deficits, um, <clears throat> such as bundle branch blocks or fascicular blocks. Uh, we'll cover those at another time. Or it could have an inferior wall myocardial infarction. Sometimes an MI uh, will cause EKG abnormalities besides just uh, you know, ST elevation is the classic signs. Sometimes it can deflect the axis away from the patient's normal axis, 
into a left axis deviation. If you don't have, if the energy to the to the bottom of the heart isn't uh, distributing properly, the energy is going to be more upward in the left direction. It stands to reason. So, other factors, pre-excitation syndromes. A certain subset of pre-excitation syndromes can present with left axis, and another set can present with right axis. Uh, it's not important to remember which is which. I believe it's the uh, posterior septal uh, ex accessory pathway that causes the uh, left axis deviation. Again, that's that's not important. That's trivial. As long as you're aware that sometimes pre-excitation can cause axis deviations. Uh, ventricular ectopics can uh, present in any orientation, including left axis deviation. Uh, congenital heart disease, uh, I believe it's a primary, uh, there's a sub subset of congenital heart disease that can present with a uh, left axis deviation, usually your, your ventral, uh, uh, ventral sub septal defects, I think, uh, present with a left axis deviation if it's a certain subset. And, importantly, mechanical shift can cause a left axis deviation. That means when you breathe out, you can actually shift your axis to the left because now your diaphragm is moving up. That moving up can shift the heart a little bit, enough to throw your axis over into the left quadrant there. Pregnancy, again, that's going to move all of your internal organs up and push up, so it could have some left axis deviation in pregnancy. Ascites, which is fluid in the abdomen, can also present with axis deviation, and so can uh, organomegaly. If you have some organs that are enlarged, or if you have a tumor, you can deflect the axis up into the left axis deviation area. And of course, a pacemaker generated rhythm or a pace rhythm can present with a left axis deviation. So right axis deviation. Some several things that can present this way, and this could be a normal finding in children and young adults. Girls have right ventricular overload syndromes, uh, like your um, acute uh, CHF. Uh, you could also have right ventricular hypertrophy, meaning the right side of the heart can be a little bit thick and a little bit more muscular, causing the energy to shift rightward. And this uh, is often related to another finding we'll discuss uh, later on on this slide. Again, your conduction uh, defects, such as your left posterior fascicular block, can present this way, as well as a right bundle branch block. And a lateral wall myocardial infarction. If the energy is not as good as going to the left hand wall of the heart, it'll maybe travel more towards the right in comparison. And again, your pre excitation syndromes, <clears throat> I believe this is a lateral accessory pathway, can cause the uh, right axis deviation and congenital heart disease. Uh, I believe this is a secondary type VSD that can cause a <clears throat> right axis deviation. Again, your dextrocardia, dextrocardia and your situs inversus can cause um, the energy to be normally for that patient down in the right axis deviation zone. Uh, that's because the actual heart is rotated or uh, flipped the other way that it's supposed to be. And uh, your right ventricular strain uh, can present this way, which means if someone has a PE, you can actually get a right shift of the, uh, a right shift of the axis. Uh, your pulmonary stenosis, your pulmonary hypertension, your chronic lung disease. Essentially, these are all respiratory-related or uh, pulmonary valve-related issues that cause stress on the right side of the heart that will cause it to hypertrophy and uh, that also cause the energy to, uh, to be more diffuse over the, the right side of the, uh, the heart. So it can present with a right axis deviation in those, and in fact, it's, it's not uncommon to see a PE present uh, with that. So we also have extreme axis deviation. So with extreme axis deviation, there's only a couple of things that can really cause it. It could be ventricular tachycardia. If you come across uh, an EKG uh, and it's wide and fast and it presents an extreme axis, it's, it's ventricular tachycardia until proven otherwise. Or it could be a pacemaker. Now usually you'll find them more often in the left axis, but sometimes it can be in the extreme you know, right axis or extreme axis deviation zone. And it's also a rare finding in some congestive cardiomyopathy and significant myocardial infarctions. Uh, those are fairly uncommon, but there are case reports of that presenting. And the last one is, is the normal axis. I'm not really sure that I, I need to make a slide for the normal axis, but I made one anyway, so I might as well cover it. It's, uh, it's normal and also could be present in a right ventricular outflow, right ventricular outflow tract tachycardia.
uh, or your ARVOT if you want to pronounce an abbreviation, your RVOT type of tachycardia can present with a normal axis. So let's do some practice. Here's an EKG. Let's break it down the simple way and figure out which way the energy is going. So looking at, uh, at this first one, we see uh, lead, uh, lead one is positive. So that means it's not going into any of those left-hand quadrants. And now we have to look at AVF. AVF is mostly negative. So that means it's moving up into the left axis deviation zone. So we're, call we're calling this a left axis deviation. Let's do another one. Here's another EKG. And uh, looking at lead, uh, lead one, it seems to be going more uh, left, or the patient's right. So we're going to exclude those zones. And looking at AVF, it's still going in the positive direction, so that means it's going downward. So that means this is a right axis deviation. One more over here. So looking at this, uh, we notice that uh, there is a normal presentation of, for, for the lead one positive, so it's going to be in the downward direction. And AVF is also, uh, sorry, lead one is positive, so it's going towards the left side of the patient. And AVF is also positive, so it's going down towards the feet, which puts this in a normal axis. And here's one more for you. So looking at this one, we're going to actually do it a little bit differently, because I'm looking at it and it strikes me just how, how negative AVF is. So looking at AVF, that energy is mostly downward. So that means we're going to rule out the bottom side, because that energy uh, is not going in the normal direction. So looking at um, so looking at lead one, it appears that is also mostly negative, which puts this in an extreme axis deviation. Uh, so this is actually uh, you know fairly bad. This is a uh, most likely a ventricular tachycardia. <clears throat> in fact, it's so bad that the EKG paper lost its color. Oh, uh, on that note, we should probably cover EKG paper. Uh, the thing that we're looking on to actually make the determination for a lot of our findings. Up until now, the what is printed on has been largely irrelevant. We're talking just about directions and energy, but coming up, we're going to be talking about some specific measurements in the next episode. So I want you to be familiar with EKG paper as a whole. So EKG paper, uh, the basics of it is, is this. Uh, the vertical axis represents voltage. The horizontal axis represents time. There is a, uh, a standard uh, format of this, and that is it's about 25 millimeters per second for chart speed. It's actually how many millimeters go by in a second when you're printing it out. Uh, and it's also usually about uh, 10 millimeters per millivolt. So that means 10 of those small boxes, 10 millimeters, represents one millivolt of energy. And you'll see some differences. Sometimes people will run it at different gains, which gain refers to how many millimeters per uh, millivolt. A gain of 0.5 will only be about 5 millimeters per millivolt, or a gain of 2 will be 20 millimeters per millivolt. And there's different times when you'd want to change the gain depending on what specifically you're looking for. Similarly, the normal chart speed is 25 millimeters per second. And on some cardiac monitors, uh, specifically what comes to mind, the, uh, the Zoll X series, you can actually change the print speed from 25 to 50 millimeters per second. And this helps actually break down the EKG a little bit, so you can actually see some of the uh, some of the findings in between the QRS complexes that might be a little bit more obscured or buried. Essentially, it's almost like pushing adenosine, except not really. But essentially, it breaks it down a little bit so you can see more in between. Uh, so that's something that you may want to consider, you know, time and patient condition allowing. But your standard is going to be 25 and 10. So uh, let's take a look at the individual boxes. We mentioned briefly that this is uh, one, one millimeter square, and it represents 0 0.04 seconds, which is rather unwieldy to say. I, I'm not sure why, why people keep on referring it to it that way. Personally, I don't. I just call it 40 milliseconds. I, I prefer working with whole numbers. So from here on out, anytime you hear me talking about width and measurements, you're going to hear me talking about it in terms of milliseconds just because I, I, no one wants to say 0 0.04 all the time. 
And the next unit we're going to look at, if we put five of those together, five times 40 is 200 milliseconds. So if you look at the thicker colored lines, the more darker pink or darker orange, depending on what color paper you have, the darker lines are going to represent 200 milliseconds or a fifth of a second. And when you put five of those together, you have a total time span of one second. Uh, now I didn't have the space to break it down here specifically, but you eventually get uh, markings every three seconds and six seconds to help you know how far the EKG is. And you can do some measurements based off of a six second EKG strip. And we'll talk about that next time when we talk about determining heart rate. And last but not least, actually it is probably least, we're going to talk about the calibration impulse. So the calibration impulse is just a little marker that's inserted by the EKG machine. Essentially, it adds a little bit of energy in a predetermined amount for a predetermined time. And this helps to determine what the filter settings are on the cardiac monitor and also help you understand what the gain is. Nowadays, you will most likely see the gain in the filters printed off at the bottom of the EKG just so you can see. But it's a good troubleshooting mechanism and it also helps you know when different leads switch. Like if you're going from you know, lead 2 to uh, you know, AVL in one horizontal strip, a lot of machines will either print up just a vertical spike to differentiate them or they'll print off another calibration impulse. But I just want you to be aware if you see a strange mark, it's called a calibration impulse. And this is what it looks like. It's a square wave and it's uh, essentially one big block wide, one big block wide by two big blocks tall. So if you see that and someone asks you what, what is that, just say it's a calibration impulse. It's just a little marker just so you know the machine settings, the machine parameters, and it's working properly. This is similar to if you're doing arterial monitoring, you can also uh, do something similar where it will imp uh, impart a waveform on the arterial waveform. And you can actually use that to determine if there's over dampening or under dampening uh, of the arterial waveform. And same sort of concept applies here, except we don't really have much control over it. Essentially, if it's not normal, call the biomed people, take the monitor out of service, and that's that. But uh, so that covers the calibration impulse. So like I mentioned, if it's thinner, this is about a gain of 0.5. So you can reduce the gain and it'll decrease the size of the overall EKG. So if you see it like this, all of your rules that we're going to talk about later as far as amplitudes, like the, the height of your ST elevations and the height of your, your R waves for hypertrophies and things of that nature, you're going to have to take those numbers and cut them in half because they're actually represented as half the amount on this EKG. So let's, uh, let's recap what we've gone over. Uh, as a summary, we've covered the EKG history. Uh, we've covered some of the EKG waves uh, as a brief outline. And uh, we've also helped to try and understand and conceptualize the direction of the energy vectors. And, and hopefully you can kind of mentally picture, you know, the energy traveling in one direction being related to the way that the energy is drawn on the EKG paper. Uh, we've also talked about calculating the energy vectors. We've done the uh, the easy way, uh, the hard way, which is the math intensive one, or the practical way. Uh, the easy way being just looking at the different uh, different leads and seeing which one is the most positive or most negative, and it's probably along those lines. So you'll probably get within 10, you know, 15 degrees if you use that method, which is close enough. Uh, the hard way, you can get the exact number, but rarely does a degree or two make any sort of clinical significant difference. And by, and by rarely, I mean uh, entirely never. And uh, the practical way is just looking at two leads and figuring out, you know, which, which quadrant is that energy in overall. There's a three-axis method where you can also look at lead two to determine whether it's, you know, which side of the normal left axis shift that is. But for purpose of keeping it simple, we're just going to talk about two axes, point to which quadrant it goes to. Those two are the horizontal one, which is your uh, lead one, and your AVF, which is your vertical lead. And uh, we've also talked about the EKG quadrants and what they represent. The reason that I went into so much detail about them is they actually do tell you a lot about your patient. Uh, EKG axis is often overlooked, um, so uh, I think a lot of these appreciations are lost. But if you see these findings and you see you know, a different quadrant than normal, they could have one of those pathologies. So it helps to build an overall picture. Um, and lastly, we talked about the EKG paper. I didn't really spend a lot of time on it. I think it's fairly self-explanatory. One millimeter is 40 milliseconds. It's just one of those road memorization things where you just have to remember that. So what we're going to talk about next time 
next time we're going to talk about calculating heart rate, uh, which is why we broke down the specific measurements of the EKG graph paper. Uh, we're going to talk about your normal sinus rhythm, and we're also going to talk about why I hate that term. Uh, we're going to talk about your atrial rhythms, your supraventricular rhythms, and then eventually we're going to get into your ventricular rhythms. Um, I'm not sure whether we're going to fit this all into next week or in two weeks, um, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. We'll, we'll plan it out when we get there. We'll, we'll kind of wing it when we get there. Um, but we'll at least cover the, uh, the supraventricular complexes and rhythms and uh, our determination thereof. So until next time, stay tuned and uh, keep thinking differently.